If you will turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 3. I'm getting ready for baptism. And, you know, sometimes we do things as churches and we do them so often it, it becomes more tradition than probably what God intends it to be. And so I had another message I'm going to preach, not next week, because next week we're doing Operation Christmas Child and we have somebody coming to present for that. Um, talk about the scriptures and the importance of that from John, but I want to talk to you about baptism. When I gave my life to Christ, um, I did it because a friend invited me from his work to go to his church, which was a Baptist church, and that is where I heard the message of what Christ had done for me. And the pastor that shared that message, he, he shared it. I gave my life to Christ, and to be honest with you, at that point, all I knew was that Christ had died for me. I was a Christian. I was enjoying this, and and I was going to a Baptist church. However, as I started to grow up in that Baptist church, you bump into other people. I've got a friend I hadn't seen in decades here this morning. He's one of those Presbyterian types, you know. And um, I've got another friend out in Arizona that's an Assembly of God. And, and, and I've got a Lutheran friend. And, and we all have some different views on the two things that we as churches are hold, to hold as ordinances. And most of the divisions in all the churches revolve around those two things, the Lord's Supper and baptism. And as a Baptist, I would hear things, and I was young in the faith, and I did not know much of anything, but I figured if they're telling me it in the church, it must be true. Kind of like what you see on TV. If you hear it on TV, it must be true. But you know, I heard the Baptist faith was started by John the Baptist. Our heritage goes all the way back there. And then I got to school and found out they lied to me. That's not where the Baptist came out of. A matter of fact, the word Baptist, we come from the Anabaptist, and it was a slur word. Because at that time in history, they thought what the Baptists were doing was stupid. And they were persecuted for it. Matter of fact, many of them were drowned for it. You want to be baptized? We'll baptize you. Don't worry, Dean. We won't do that today. But what happened was there was a monk which he, he was the one that actually formed the Lutheran church, Martin Luther, began to study his Bible, and he found out that we are saved by what? Grace through faith and not ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, so no man can boast. And he began to preach that, and he said, really, we shouldn't, as he studied the Bible, said we shouldn't even be baptized unless we believe in what Christ has done. Up until that point, what you were, you were baptized into the church. And so that's where they would baptize the babies and baptize, you were baptized into the church. And so that worked real well, but he realized that doesn't line up with the message of the scripture. And so there was this conflict that arose. And so the Anabaptists began to say, we need to baptize those who have only put their faith in Christ. And so they were baptizing people again. The church was saying, wait a minute, that's wrong. We, we baptize them into the church. We're the real church. And, and fighting broke out. And unfortunately, even today, fighting still breaks out over what? Baptism. Some of y'all know that. Uh, some will teach, well, you're not saved if you're not baptized. And some, you're still baptized in the church. We have a young lady that I just think the world of comes to our house. She was baptized into the church. She's Catholic. So if you ask her, hey, you, I was baptized, I'm good. It didn't matter if she was a baby or not, I'm, I'm good. I'm, there it is. And so what I want to do this morning is we get ready to take our candidates, and, and, and I believe most of them are here. Um, we're going to talk about what baptism is, and why do we baptize, and why is it so important that Jesus would command us to do that. If you look with me at Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 13, and all I'm going to do this morning is answer some questions. It won't be the typical sermon, but I'm hoping it will help us understand and maybe force us to study a little bit. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 13. John the Baptist has been preaching. He's out in the wilderness. He's uh, crying out, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he's baptizing people. And that's a sign of repenting from their sin. And so Jesus, in verse 13, says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Are you coming to me? Now this is very important, this answer. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed. All right. 
You didn't say this. It doesn't say this in your Bible. And Jesus answered and said, I need to be baptized because I'm a sinner and I need to repent for my sins. Because Jesus is not a sinner. He's sinless. He's the Messiah. So here's your answer when somebody hits you with that. Jesus says, because John's wanting to know, I should be baptized by you. I'm a sinner. You're not. And Jesus answered and said to him, permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we are getting ready for this service today, I pray that you would help us understand the weight of it, what it means. Father, I think sometimes we have made it just such a tradition and a habit, we don't think about actually what we're doing sometimes. And so, Father, these candidates that are going to be baptized today, they're making a proclamation and they're identifying with something. And we're going to celebrate as they should. But help us to understand exactly what baptism is. And let us just be reminded, Father, these times and these seasons in our church that uh, this is a big deal, but it's a great deal. And it's all because of what Jesus Christ has done. Father, we thank you for what your Son has done on our behalf. We even come to you with this prayer because your Son is our mediator and our high priest. So we thank you. Help us to identify with Christ. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. When I was a new Christian, I'd asked a lot of questions as I studied the Bible. And one of them was, why is Jesus getting baptized if he's sinless and not a sinner? He's all God and all man. Why is he doing a, a baptism of repentance? Now, there's a reason for this. And I think uh, Alistair Begg answers is the best I've ever heard anybody answer it. He says, for two reasons. First, to identify. He has come to identify with us at every point. Matter of fact, the Bible says he was even tempted in every way we were. Because we have a high priest that understands where we are. And so as Jesus went through this life, as, as he was incarnated and became a man, he did everything that he was supposed to do as a man. And so he's identifying with us. But really what he's also doing here is he's consecrating himself to God. When it says it's fitting for righteousness, what he's really saying is we need to do this because this is right. This is what God would have me to do. This is right in his eyes. Um, and so what he's doing, he's doing this to fulfill God's will and desire for man. And so we have an example to follow. That's why Jesus did it. But why do we do it? As a matter of fact, he commands us. Just turn over, same book, Matthew, turn over to Matthew 28. And sometimes we as Baptists get this all messed up. Matthew 28, the empty tomb. He appears to the disciples, and then in verse 18, he gives a great commission. He appoints them, and verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now this is what the great commission is. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. That is the charge and the command Christ has given us. To make, not believers, not converts, to make disciples of Essex County, is that what he says? Of all what? Nations. So part of our, our, our mission as a church is not just to do ministry here, but to go out what? There, to other parts of the world. He says, baptizing and making disciples. And then, then here's the charge. Look, baptizing them in the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit. So when we baptize, that's what we do. And teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus commands us to baptize. And so that's why we call it one of the ordinances, one of the things that we practice from here until he comes back within the church. He gave us the Lord's Supper, and he gave us this. And he wants us to make disciples, and part of that is baptizing them. Now, here's where the controversy starts. How are we to baptize? Billy Graham and Ruth Graham had a fight in their marriage that lasted their entire marriage. She was Presbyterian. He was Baptist. 
How do Presbyterians baptize, David? Sprinkling. Sprinkling. How do Baptists baptize? Immersion. We're biblical. I'm teasing, David. I'm teasing. And this is, this is the way the fights happen. He said, you need to be immersed. And she said, no, that's not what the issue is. And this symbolized the same thing you did. Now, here's the, here's the key to the whole thing. They both put their faith in Christ. They both believed in Christ. What saves them, the baptism or their faith in Christ? All right, we believe that. We're all on the same page with that. Amen, David? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that is what it is. The, the issue is, is how we go about doing it. And part of that, if we're honest, is tradition. If you're in our Bible study class, you know there's four sources of authority. One of those is tradition. But let me share with you why we at Ephesus hold to the way we baptized. Okay, we believe in immersion. And that Greek word, and, and this isn't even debatable. This isn't even something that's a gray area. This is as black and white as you can get. That word baptismo means to submerge. And so to submerge something means to what? Submerge something. It's real simple. Um, that's what that word does. And, and throughout our Bible, like in Mark 1.10, it says this, and immediately coming up from the water. So we know when Jesus was baptized, it doesn't mean he's coming walking out. In the Greek, it means he's coming up from the water. So we know when he was baptized, it was by Okay, um, stay with me, David. Don't leave. I'm, I'm gonna make the point. All right. In Acts chapter eight, it talks about the, the 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 eunuch Philip when he comes to know Christ. He says, "Now when they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is the water. What hinders us from being baptized?' Now Philip didn't leave it there. Philip said this: "If you believe with all your heart, you may." And he answered and said, "I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. See, that's what comes first. Verse 38, so he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and baptized him. So the reason we believe this is not just these things. It's also, and we quote this at every baptismal service, and I'll quote it today, is because of, I do it because it's Rome, of Romans 6. Romans 6, starting in verse 1, says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? By no means. We have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, or just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too can walk in newness of life. The baptismal service is a funeral service. And what we're doing, Dean, when you get into the water is, the old Dean, I had Glenn Hayden tell me that today, made me feel good. He said, that's old Larry. Now he's known me since I'm a Christian, so that means part of Larry is still dying. But on that day, I was baptized into his death can you hold a dead man guilty of his crimes? You can't. And when I put my faith in Christ, he not only forgave my sins and washed them clean, I entered into his death so I can't even be held guilty anymore. But he doesn't leave me there. God loves us right where we are no matter what we're doing. He loves us where we are, but he loves us enough not to leave us where we are. And so he raises us up so we can walk in newness of life. The reason we do immersion baptism here is not just because we're Baptists, because it fits the picture of Scripture of the funeral service, buried and raised. I did the first thing I've ever done in my, all my years of ministry. Yesterday, we buried Tammy's mom. And there were some things going on, and we needed to make sure the vault was sealed. And so we stayed for the whole thing. The family left, and I wanted to make sure that her wishes were honored, so we stood there and we watched them lower the casket down and put the dirt on top. Well, they lowered it down, then they put the vault top on top, and then they put the dirt on. I've never seen that. As many funerals I've done, I've never seen that. They bring the big uh, backhoe in and just filled it all in and, and did that, and then they packed the ground tight and put everything back the way it was supposed to and lay the grass where it was supposed to be and, and all that. She is what? Buried. 
And even though her body is there, her soul and spirit are not, she is dead and gone. And there will come a day when Christ will come back and her soul and her spirit will be reunited with her glorified body. She will be raised up and she will live eternally in this physical body with her soul and spirit. Not because of what she has done, but because of what Christ has done. And so we do it by immersion. Um, I have a lot of, and I can do this with David because I haven't seen him in a while, but we always, we picked up where we left off. You know, I didn't see them scattering dirt on her. I dig it. Buried her. And so we believe that. Now, many of you, some of you are Methodists that come to this church. Some are Presbyterian. Some of you have been sprinkled and some of you have been poured. The most important part of the whole thing is where you put your faith. Is it in what Christ has done? If that is true, your baptism is just an outward sign of your inward commitment. So I'm not going to sit here and, and beat him. I've been digging because I haven't seen him in a while. But I'm not going to disown him and say, well, you're not right with God. Because that's between him and who? And to be honest with you, I will not have to stand before the Lord on his account. I'll have to stand on the Lord on my account and him vice versa. And Lord judges us where our heart is. And I struggled, and I'll just share this as your pastor, when me and Skipper were witnessing to, I can't think of the gentleman's name right now, it escapes me, but we went to his house and we shared the gospel with him and, and he prayed to receive Christ. Let me tell you something, I can't baptize him. He's going to die in that bed. So how do I baptize him? I'm commanded to. So you know what we did? We poured. We did that with another gentleman that was going through cancer. Skipper, you were with me for both of these, I think. And he was with cancer, and we didn't know how he was doing, and, and we did that with him. So your pastor has struggled through some of this, but really it's about what we believe in and what it symbolizes. Does that make sense? And so what we're doing today, Ronnie, is, is your funeral service. The old rotten Ronnie is dead. And the new Ronnie has, has raised up that you may walk in newness of life. And so that's what baptism is. That's, how, that's why at Ephesus we do that. Now, let me share uh, something else with you on this about why we, we do this. Because we need to look at what does baptism mean. Now, I want you to write these things down because we should do all three of these today at our baptismal service. The first one is it's a celebration of grace. Because we recognize we deserve judgment for God, but Jesus stood in the gap. And because of that, we have been freed from that, that punishment. I'm going to read you from Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 15. It says, talking about Christ, For in Him dwells all fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality and power. In Him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Now in the Israel, what you would do is you were born into that nation, and you would symbolize that with a physical circumcision of your foreskin. And then you would say, I am a Jew, and, and so since I'm a Jew, I'm God's person. And Jesus would come along later and says, doesn't work that way. Just because you're born into this family doesn't make you part of God's family. And, and in Colossians, the author is making this correlation between that physical and the spiritual. He says, our circumcision was made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. He took our, our heart of flesh and he circumcised it, if you will, and gave us a new spirit and a new heart. And then verse 12, it says, well, let me just go back. By circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made you alive together with him, having forgiven you, forgiven all your trespasses, not part of them, not the ones before you, all of them, past, present, and future. He has wiped out the handwriting and the requirements that was against you, which was contrary to us. And he, talking about Jesus, and he has taken it out 
of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them and he triumphed over them. He defeated them. And so what we're saying is at this baptismal service is, and I'm just going to pick on the ones I know won't crucify me. So Tiffany, I'm sorry, but you love me. I know you won't crucify me. Tiffany is a beautiful young lady. Would you all agree? She's bad. <laughs> she has got a, a record, a rap sheet. I know some of it. She is really bad. And I hate to say this, so is Dean Brooks. <laughs> Kaylee Long looks sweet, but she's bad. <laughs> and Ronnie's bad. As a matter of fact, we are so bad that we deserve punishment. We had a life sentence hanging over us. And what Christ did is he totally took that away. The wages of sin, let's see if you can finish the verse. The wages of sin is death. And that's what we all deserve. That funeral service yesterday is a consequence of sin. We deserve death. And to be honest with you, death and sin, they had all this power over us. And what Christ did is he came and the first thing he did was he took our rap sheet and he covered it. He covered it with his blood. Our sins, we sing it to him. What washes away our sins? Nothing but the... He washed the rap sheet clean. He nailed it to the cross. That's been dealt with. And then he took our guilt and he dealt with that. And then what he did is says, you're going to enter into me. So when we enter into his death, we also enter into his life. Those of us that have gone through the gospel project, I hope you pick this up through that Sunday school literature. Jesus and Jesus alone kept the law. And those that keep the law get a blessing with it. So who gets the blessing? Jesus. There was covenants made throughout our Bible. And those guys couldn't really keep that covenant. Jesus kept all the covenants and he gets the blessings of those covenants. So he gets to reign and rule. And he gets the, the blessings that come. He gets all of that. And listen, he's the only one that obeyed God in everything he did. And because of that and he chose life, he gets the blessings and the promises of that. And you know what he did? He lets us enter into that. And so when he died to sin, guess what? We died to sin. And when we raised up from life, guess what we get? This should, this should break our heart and make us celebrate. We get all the blessings promised to the law keeper. And we didn't keep any of them. Tiffany, I know you haven't kept them. Neither have I. But because of what Jesus done, we get all the blessings. He kept all the covenant. So we get all the blessings of that. That's why it says we're joint heirs with him. Listen, we're going to rule with him. We're going to reign with him. We get the inheritance he deserves. And listen, we don't deserve any of that. We get that. Why? Because simply because we put our faith in what he did. And he loves us so much that he says, you're going to enter into my identity. So when I die and step off, and I give you all permission to do this today, you can talk to David and see how bad I used to be. He laughed because he knows. He said, oh, I can't wait. That's why I showed up here today, Larry. <clears throat> they already know most of it, David. Um, when I stand before Christ, he's not going to say, you remember, you remember her? Do you remember what you did that night after the football game? Do you remember what you did in 20? Do you remember when you broke into that house? He's not going to do that. He's going to look at me and see who? Christ. And because of everything Christ has done, he's going to look at me and say, you fulfilled the law and the covenants and you kept my word. And you were a man that desired because of what my son did. You're wonderful. And so we need to celebrate that. Amen? So when y'all get baptized today, celebrate that he did it all for you. And Tiffany, if you were the only one on the planet, he still would have done it for you. And Ryan, with all that you've done, he would have done that for you. Where's Edie? I've been picking on everybody but Edie. Same. Pick away. Pick away. Now, some will say this, and, and we don't agree with this, and there's different views. Catholics hold to this, Church of Christ holds us. And they get this from a couple of verses. They get it from Acts 22 16. It says, And now, while were you waiting, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. So they say that your baptism just washes away your sins, and that's really what it is. But we know that's not what our entire Bible teaches. It teaches that Christ washes away our what? Sins. They use that verse and they use this verse from Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And it goes on and says, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And what some people teach 
is that the baptism itself washes away the sin and the baptism itself saves you. So let me just show you what, what, how seriously they take this. We're getting ready to head to the river and one of my baptismal candidates has a car accident and dies. They would say they're going to hell. I'm, I'm sorry they believed in Christ. I'm sorry they put their faith in Christ. But because they didn't make the baptismal water, they didn't make it. And they use these verses to back it up. But they're forgetting the rest of what the Bible says about baptism. And they're forgetting some key factors that are in this verse alone. Let me read you the verses again see if you can pick up on it. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. What's the saving factor in that? Believe. It's the belief. God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The thief is in a bad spot if that is true. And I've heard, my cousin who goes to Church of Christ, and we've gone around and around the rosemary bush about this, and he'll say, well, you don't understand. That was before the Holy Spirit. And Look, you can twist it however you want to. Either we're saved by faith and faith alone, or you're saved plus, with faith plus being baptized. And that's works, is it not? <coughs> Now, baptized is very, being baptized is very important to God, but I want to give you an illustration to help you if you run into somebody like that. Every wedding that I do, I'm getting ready to do a couple weddings, and I will say this, with this ring, I thee wed. So the ring makes you married. Well, I just said it, so that's the vow, isn't it? Isn't that what makes you married? If you take the ring off, you're not married. Put the ring on, you... Are married? Is that how it works? Some people. Some people think so. Yeah, some people think so. No, that's, this ring is a symbol of a covenant I'm making with God and, and, and my spouse. And so I put the ring on as a symbol and I said, with this ring, the ring is the symbol. The ring doesn't make me married. Same way baptism doesn't save me. In fact, there's a lot of people that are baptized, they haven't put their faith in Christ and they're counting on that baptism to save them, and it won't. It's the belief and the faith we put in Christ. Baptism is a physical outward sign of what Christ has done, just like this ring is. And so I want you to remember today that it's a celebration of grace. We're celebrating what God has done, but it is also a proclamation of Christ. Dean, what you're saying to the entire world and the rest of the church when you get baptized today is this. I'm no longer in my own. I'm living for Him. Now, you're going to do that perfectly, son? No, you've already messed up, haven't you? You sure have. So have we. But what we're saying to everybody is I'm following Christ now. And one of the best things and the hardest things about a baptismal service is after the baptism, people are going to do some of this to you. Should you be doing that? Weren't you baptized? Now, if they're saying that, we may need to step back and evaluate our life a little bit. They may be doing that to pick on us. But what we're doing is we're identifying with Christ. We're saying we are now His. And so my life is going to be different. And so it's the best witnessing tool you can have. So we're proclaiming Christ. The other one is this. We're proclaiming the picture of the gospel, the death and life and the resurrection of Christ. And I've already gone over that, so I won't beat that horse anymore. But who do we baptize? This is who we baptize at Ephesus, believers only. Only those who put their faith in Christ. Stand up if you're getting baptized. I won't embarrass you. I've already embarrassed you enough, haven't I? These are the people that are getting baptized today. You can sit back down. And what they're doing is they have heard the gospel or they've come to know it more deeply and they've recognized that I have got to give my life to Him. They've prayed. They've received it. Now what they're doing is they're making an outward proclamation and a celebration and giving a picture of their death and resurrection because they put their faith in Christ. Baptism doesn't save you. There's a lot of baptized people that are not going to make it to heaven. It's the truth. The Bible says there's one Lord and one faith and one baptism. Now when we get baptized, I will say this, and I've gotten some flack for this. Patty will remember this because you went through this with me. You remember when Trey Shaver was baptized? He was my first baptism ever. Shared the gospel with him and, and we baptized him. And Patty said, so he's joining the church. And I said, no, he's not joining the church. He's just being baptized. Well, I didn't know in Baptist churches one went hand in hand. 
You were baptized into membership is what a lot of churches will even say. That's not the case. We're being baptized because we put our faith in Christ. The membership of a church is making a commitment and covenant with that church. And Trey said, I don't want to join this church, but I do want to be baptized. So I had a dilemma. And, and Patty helped me wrestle with that a little bit. And, and we did that. But I'm gonna, I want everybody to hear me when I say this. So you can quote me on this. Because we're baptizing you, we're baptizing you because you put your faith in Christ. Okay, does that mean you have to join this church? No. But you have to join a church somewhere. Because you're making a commitment to the body of Christ. And so you need a church family. You can't do this on your own. I heard a man that baptized himself in the pool. It doesn't work that way. Because what you're doing is making a proclamation to a ch not just our church, but to the world that I belong to Christ. And Christ is very big on this. You need to have a church what? Family. You really need that. That's commanded. And listen, we're not a perfect church. Amen? We, we brush each other wrong. We, there's some personalities we just conflict with a little bit. But he calls us to love one another, to serve with one another, and fulfill the mission of the Great Commission together as a church. So when you're baptized, you don't have to join a church, but you can't be baptized without a church. Does that make sense? We need to commit ourselves to a church and encourage and support the work of that church and their mission. And that's part of our covenant with God and with each other. Does that make sense? I was baptized when I was seven years old, 10. I was baptized in a Methodist church by immersion in a pond. And I was excited. We had gone through a class, and, and, and Jesus was just my hero. I admired him. I thought the world of him. Um, did I really understand? No. And back then, what you did is all the kids at that age would go and be baptized. And, and we would do that, and every, but it wasn't until I was 18 years old that I understood I was a sinner, that I was more wicked than I thought I even was. I knew I smoked. I knew I drag raced. I knew I ran from the police. I knew I broke into homes. I knew that was bad. I didn't know my thought life was bad. I didn't know my heart motives were bad. I didn't realize how bad I really was. And, and when that pastor shared how bad I was, I thought to myself, well, now I know I'm going to hell. I thought I was going to hell. Now I know I was going to hell. And then when he shared that verse, and it was the verse that God used to open my eyes, it is by grace that you're saved through faith and not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not of works, so no man can boast. And I understood for the first time in my life, all of y'all were just as bad as me. That pastor was just as bad as me. And we all deserve that, but God has given me this gift of salvation. And he said, Larry, do you want to receive this gift? And I understood. I said, I want this. What do I got to do? Do you hear all that me talk? What do I have to do? How do I get to? He said, you just need to ask him for it. I don't know how to ask him for it. How do I ask him for it? Well, you just pray. Well, what do I pray? Can you pray it for me? No, son, I can't pray it for you. Well, what do I need to tell him? You need to tell him you're a sinner. I said, oh, I know that. He said, and you need to ask him for his forgiveness, and he'll forgive you. That sounded too easy to me, but it was too good to miss. And so on the floor in his living room, I prayed, and I received, and I was changed. I was changed so much, my mom thought I had joined a cult. I was washing dishes and cleaning up and doing things. Because God had raised me to newness of life. And I was baptized in the baptismal just like that. And because I was so tall, I hit my head on the steps because I was too big for the baptismal. I'll never forget that. But it was a wonderful day. I hope your baptism is a wonderful day today. But I hope you will celebrate knowing all that Christ has done for you today because he loves you so much. And that, Ronnie, you recognize I'm making a proclamation in the world that as hard as it, I'm going to start walking in newness of life and, and following him. And realizing, Dean, that you're dead and you're buried and the dead man can't be held guilty for the charges against him. And all of this is, we're able to do why?
because of what Christ has done. And if you are just hearing this for the first time and understand it, you grab me before church. I mean, after church is over. And we may baptize you today if you believe and put your faith in Christ. Amen? But you do what the Lord leads you today. Linda, I'm excited for you. Kaylee, I'm excited for you. Edie, we're praying for you. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Edie is a good girl. And church, we, each one of us, needs to learn how to share our faith and share it with people that don't know. Because I don't know if I would even be walking or be here today if Christ hadn't met me when I was 18 years old. I was on a bad path. And I'm thankful for Ray Williams and Ken Gow. And I hope when you get to heaven, there'll be some people who say, man, I am so thankful for Shelby Brooks, or Barbara Webb. So let's go, Lord, in prayer as we go. Heavenly Father, I thank you for our church family, but I thank you far more that you've made us a family through the death of your son. And Father, what a horrible, horrible thing that he had to go through to reconcile men to you. But what a tremendous love that you have for us. A terrible love that does not rest and pursues us hard and shares with us every day even despite the fact we suppress the truth and how you do not give up. It's your will that none should perish. And so, Father, I thank you for opening our eyes that we could see the truth and that we gave our life to you. Father, I thank you for these candidates. And, Father, they're probably just like me. They're just, this is just new. And I didn't know all that I was doing. I didn't know all your truth. I didn't know all your word. I was still doing things that displeased you, but I didn't know that at the time. Just like a baby, you loved me, you changed my diapers, you helped me to learn to walk and then learn to run. You smacked my hand when I was doing things I shouldn't. And Father, I pray that you would just help us grow up in Christ, to trust you, to love you, to abide in your shadow, and that you would transform these candidates by the work in their heart. Circumcision without hands, that changes a life forever. We thank you for being so good to us despite ourselves. Father, I pray that you would just bless the weather, the baptismal, the picnic, that it would be a time of celebration, a time where we get a small taste of what heaven's going to be like, loving one another. Father, we thank you for Ephesus and thank you so much for what you've done at this church. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Pam is gone. Uh, her mother was sick, and so she wanted to go check on her. So I can do one of two things, and I, I've made a decision. We're going to solo it. Yeah, that's so good. I, yeah, Joanne said you. No, 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 you. Come on up here, Joanne. I'm teasing. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to do what we do at the Lord's Supper. And we're going to stand across the aisle. If you're visiting, you don't know this. I want you to listen to the words, because this is becoming part of the family, and I think this would be very fitting to sing as we get ready to go to baptismal service. So if we can stand up. Chris, I forgot to mention your name. You were hiding behind Jim. I couldn't see you. And so if we can reach across the aisle and hold hands. And we're going to sing, Blessed Be the Tide That Binds. And I will start if y'all will follow. I will not solo it. You don't want me to. All right, y'all ready? Blessed be.